Hello you Malsy, Mad Madam Mims, and thank you to John for that malt mention introducing Ralphie Review 1023, in which I record my 1023rd um, quality spirits review here on this channel called Ralphie.com featuring of course the Bothy. The Bothy being some remote obscure little uh, place on an island in the middle of the Irish Sea. Now this is quite important because it gives me access to a lot of whiskies that whether because they're just new distilleries starting out or whether they happen to be single cask independent bottlings they may not ever leave the shore shores of the UK because there's simply not enough bottles to allow that to happen so I tend to be in quite early when new whiskies are appearing on the market and I'm always on the lookout for the better quality ones however when there's not that many around I go back to some dependables. Whiskies out there, single malts in particular, that I've known for many years, but I tend to leave in the back burner as a one of those I'll get round to it someday type malts. And this is a very good example of that. Uh, Loch Lomond, single malt whiskey. It's a Highland style of whiskey, but very much the Lowland Highlands and um, it's 18 years old, bottled at 46% and uh, unchill filtered. So, let's crack on with it. Now just to let you know, unless you are a Patreon subscriber, you'll have missed my first recording of this review because <laughs> my dear old microphone I call this old faithful it's a road I'll bring it forward it's a road R-O-D-E this has been a very reliable microphone over the years I recommend them as a brand I'm, I've been using this for all my reviews from the Bothy and I've been using this particular model. It is what's called a shotgun microphone so it's specific directional to pick up what's being said directly in front of it. It's what's called, that's the reason it's called a shotgun mic. And it's also got a battery capacity um, to amplify, there we go, there's the battery, to amplify the power of the microphone. As I say it's been fantastic however it's seen better days it has been squashed dropped and repacked repadded sorry with a kitchen pad to give it a little bit of cushioning but i'm now going to retire this microphone and i have a new one so let me know what you think of the sound because modern microphones after about 10 years they're so much smaller and yet they seem more powerful but hey that's technology. The technology that goes into a single malt is a lot more restrained. It's a fairly basic process. The distillers like to say there are three simple ingredients. This is not true. It never has been. New Make Spirit has three ingredients um, and they're not so simple. They appear simple, yeast, malted barley and water, but that's not the case. Even the influence of water in the production of a spirit can have a significant impact in the direction it goes, i.e., what do I mean? Hard water and soft water, heavily mineralated water and very soft mineralated water. This all adds up. And the fact is that the majority of Scotch whisky is made using soft water. There are exceptions. Highland Park is a good example. But if you were to use the water out of Loch Lomond, uh, or Loch Catron, which is beyond Loch Lomond, which is the main water supply for the whole central belt, west central belt of Scotland, you'll find, apart from the very beautiful location, that the water is very soft. And that is ideal 
for this style of whiskey. It's a soft whiskey. It's a gentle whiskey. It is unpeated. It is a malt driven experience. And so when you start to nose it, you immediately get soft, unpeated, unpeated, rich barley sugar, slightly toffied notes. With the 18 years, you're noticing it on the nose. It's coming across as aromatic oak wood, specifically American oak, which is adding in a soft vanilla note and actually emphasizing the honey, slightly honeyed, toffied nature of this style of malt. Although Loch Lomond is in the Highland region, it is essentially, um, in my opinion, a lowland malt because it is so near the borderline. It's the same with Glengoyne. I also regard Glengoyne as a, as, as a lowland malt, although I've, I really don't buy Glengoyne these days. Anyway, what, how about the taste? First shot of the taste. Sweet and sour, with the emphasis quickly on the sour. It's quite closed up, quite a simple malt, simple arrival, simple development, simple finish. With experience, as you develop your palate, you'll know immediately when you sip a whiskey neat from a recently opened bottle that it's still shut down. It's still effectively in hibernation as a taste experience. So what happens is the whiskey goes into the bottle, the bottle is stopped, the bottle's sealed. Effectively, the spirit kind of goes to sleep in the bottle. Um, there's nothing to oxidize it. There's nothing to release the wonderful array of natural chemicals that are responsible for smell and taste. And therefore they are held in stasis. Um, within the bottle until it's opened, the glass is poured. Then you have the combination of physical agitation, the introduction of oxygen through the air, and also what really helps is adding some water. Now, I've just added five millilitres of water. You don't add all your water at once, you add it in installments. You add it in increments, little at a time over time. So just a small drop, then you leave the glass, and then if you need to add more, that is the point that you do add more. Particularly with older whiskies, you have to use less water, but you will judge things according to your own specific palate, experience, and desires from, from what you're drinking. And um, the de final decision is yours for a very simple reason, you bought the bottle. I've added a drop of water, immediately noticing a little bit of scotch mist, not as much as I'd like to see, but it's early days yet. And I'm also noticing what's called the vicimetry. This is that kind of ripple effect that you get in the liquor once you've re recently added water, as it disturbs the, the different density, the thicker density of the matured spirit, which contains not only barley oils from the main ingredient, but also wood oils from extracted out of the wood, and also long chain proteins and um, congeners. So, back to the glass. What are we getting in the nose? Something fuller, richer and creamier. Even after a couple of minutes of adding some water, and it was five millilitres of water, a teaspoon is a perfect pen measure. It just works like a ladle. It is opening up. It is developing complexity. And this is what we're waiting for. As I've said in the past, I'll say it again, one minute in the glass for each year in the cask, and then add some particularly for better quality whiskies. You'll get more of a range of the experience over time when you do this, and you'll tap into the actual complexity that you're paying the premium for. So, let's have a taste. The sweet and sour is more distinctive 
There's a slight sherry note in there as well and tannins really getting some quite intense but oily tannins. There is some euthamol in there which is a kind of green vegetal chemical note. It's very pleasant. It's slightly minty. It reminds me actually of some of the milder Irish whiskies and lowland scotch, particularly west coast lowland scotch and Irish whisky actually have a lot in common due to their geographical proximity. It's called the regionality. If you're into Irish whisky by the way you, you will notice after a while the difference between uh, the whisky styles in the south of Ireland and in the middle and in the east and the west. And there you have it. It, it really comes with experience um, and this is what, what I'm, I'm here to provide commentary uh, to share my experience to help you with yours. Cheers. Back to the taste again because there's more going on here but you don't just sip and sip and sip you need to let your palate rest between sips. Let it settle down, let it recalibrate from the previous experience and then we come back again for another taste. It's ginger creeping into this, ginger notes. Fresh ginger and green ginger. Touch of cola. Very background hint of both banana and mild apricot. There's a hint of melon in the background as well. But for, at the forefront is this distinctive barley sugar note. So if you're ever in Scotland, by the way, go into a confectionery shop uh, and you're looking for the sweets that they sell, have uh, stacked up in the shelves in jars. Uh, big three litre jars, four litre jars. Uh, and ask for a quarter of um, barley sugars, which is a boiled sweet made using malted barley, originally. Originally. Most, most confectionery now contains extract of oil products these days because that's where the synthesised flavourings come from. But even in its modern form, it still gives you a useful point of reference as to the flavour note that I'm talking about here. The oakiness is quite strident, but beginning to settle back down again. This is, in fact, a, a very tasty whisky. And go further, I would say that when you look at the price, and this is one of the things about Loch Lomond is they're quite unpretentious as a distillery. They, they, they know where they're at and they know that they're looking for a certain volume of sale rather than to exclude sales with overpricing. And therefore to get an 18 year old single malt, particularly at 46%, unchill filtered, for less than £100 in the UK is, is, is an absolute result. And it's just a disappointment really that there's, there's a few other single malt brands out there that when they bottle their 20, 18 or 21 year old whiskey, they're bottling it at 43%, which means it's chill filtered. So they are denaturing and deflavoring the whiskey at that age and then asking for a massive premium. Uh, some people out there would describe those distilleries as taking the piss. Uh, I tend to agree. Loch Lomond, refreshingly, is, um, is, in my opinion, more transparent. They're very communicable. The distillery used to be highly industrial, and I've said a bit of a dump, yeah, with barbed wire in the fences, lots of rubbish out in the backyard. That's a few years ago. They have, to their credit, tidied the place up significantly. Um, but it's very much a whisky factory rather than what you and I perceive as a more glamorised whisky distillery. However, there's new ownership involved with Loch Lomond in the last few years. They are seriously turning things around and greatly improving the quality of their presentation. So I suspect strongly that before the end of this year, 2024, I will be back to review another Loch Lomond. Final notes on this one before I before I go on, on with my preparing for my extras, which is my next review. 
Love, lovely barley sugar, aromatic toffee, slightly gingery, solid arrival. Starts to fade in the development quite rapidly, but the initial contact holds up really well throughout the development. And the finish is soft, tannic, gingery, and actually fresh and elegant. This is not a complex whiskey. It never has been. I doubt it ever will be. But I really appreciate the relative honesty of the presentation. Do I think there's caramel colourant in there? Yes, I do. I think they've put some caramel colourant in. Um, and I think that's the one thing that holds it back. And I think that that caramel colourant does impact on the whiskey's finish. It kind of clips it a little bit, clips the wings of this, but still a competent single malt. Let me give it a malt mark. Eighty-three out of a hundred. It's a malt mark for Loch Lomond, eighteen-year-old single malt Scotch whisky. Hope you've enjoyed this review, and I hope you'll join me again for Ralphie Review One Thousand and Twenty-Three Extras, in which I will be giving you additional extra information that relates to Scotch whisky, which I assure you, malt mates, you're going to find very, very useful. See you soon.